Um, okay, let me see. Um, oh, I hear another point number four. Uh, please forgive me if something doesn't work right. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I, I was going to say it's just a miracle to see you all. Uh, that's that's uh, no pun intended, but it is good to see you all. And, uh, you know, getting this all set up and doing it, uh, it takes some doing, I think, Pastor Danielle and all. Uh, that uh, that I was able that we can do this and with the help that I've gotten. So uh, I'm kind of ready to go with that. And uh, and uh, having us all together is uh, is really such a such a special time. So I would like to begin with a word of prayer. So uh, let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly and good Father, Mother, we give you thanks because we know that you are with us even in these times when we are so separated. We ask again that we would know your presence in this day, in this teaching, and that these words might be only to glorify you, to give you thanks, and to give you that place in our lives that is so important in all that we do. Be with us this day. Bless us, those who are healing, those who are seeking healing, that they might know your healing presence. This we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, uh, as I said before, it really is kind of a, a miracle uh, to see you all. And I thought about this and I thought, you know, what, uh, what is a miracle? Uh, to my grandfather, uh, the fact that we can talk to each other without going through an operator is a miracle. And uh, to my father, uh, that we can speak with each other like this without any wires is a miracle. And, uh, and I would say for myself that I can uh, speak to you and talk to you right here in your living room and see you all is a miracle. So what, think about what it is, what a, what a miracle is for you. We have things like... Uh, the miracle on ice, you know, a sporting event, or um, uh, <laughs> on the internet, I found on Google, uh, bless miracle beauty cream. I don't know what that is, but I'll just take it for what it's named. Uh, but there's miracle grow for our gardens. Um, I might even say it was a miracle that I was only on hold for five minutes with my internet provider the other day. Uh, that's a miracle. But what about you? Uh, if you tell me what you think uh, a miracle is for you. I'm, I'm hoping no one's speaking with their mute on. <laughs> All righty. Um, this is Debbie. Yes, Debbie. And I think it's a miracle that we have two children who work in the healthcare field, in um, one in an ER setting and one as a respiratory therapist. And so far, they have both stayed healthy, even though being um, exposed to this virus pretty much on a daily or work basis. Absolutely. Oh, praise God. Praise God. How good. They, they are definitely the frontline soldiers in this battle, for sure. Who else? Anybody else have a, the, uh, what they're thinking of when they think of miracles? Yeah, we're sitting right here beside me. <laughs> I'm sorry, one more? Gil sitting right here beside me. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you click on one of the more pictures, it took that on the lines. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, I, I would think that probably all of us have sometimes said that there was a miracle in our lives. There were things that felt like a miracle in our lives. Now, the, the Webster's definition 
for a miracle is uh, an extraordinary event that manifests a divine intervention in human affairs. In other words, somebody, something or a divine being intervenes from the outside into what otherwise is an ordinary life or sometimes an extremely outstanding or unusual event or a thing or an occur uh, that, that accomplishment that occurred, like I mentioned, the, the miracle on ice, things that you just, just or people that are, the first time there was a four minute mile that was run or some time like that, which just seems like a miracle. But the Catholic Church, the, the Lutheran Church, um, and you know, David, you can back me up on this and, and Pastor Danielle uh, or not, uh, that the Lutheran Church is not real strong on um, on miracles. We don't have a lot that we point to and look to in terms of our faith. And there's a reason for that, and we'll talk about that later. But the Roman Catholic Church is different uh, in that there are a lot of uh, miracles or what are called miracles and still remembered and and still looked at today. The miracle miracles for a for the Roman Catholic Church uh, has five, what, are, what are called five aspects. Uh, that have to be fulfilled. Uh, first of all, it has to be something that is attributable to a divine power. What happens has to be what God has done. Whether it's through a saint or through a pope or through someone else, it is still a, a, an act of God. So it's not something that could be, and that happens that we just don't know why it happened. Uh, a tornado or an earthquake or something, uh, or a hidden force of nature. Uh, or something that could be make something to happen like that, like a bomb, these are not obviously uh, miracles. They're wonderful, they're marvelous, they're in, in, incredible to do, but they're not uh, miracles. Then also, secondly, the second aspect of a miracle is that it has to be beyond the power of created nature, beyond the power. It has to be more than nature could do. That is to say, the essence of the effect has to be produced by the glorification that God has done. It's an example of this, that by nature, anything that's caused can have a power that's even greater than and of itself, which comes from God. Um, there had the nature and the subject, which is happening has to be something that is outside nature. For example, nature produces life in humans. But a life in a corpse or a person who has died is something that is beyond nature. It is not. It is natural to have sight, but it is not natural for a person who is blind to have sight. So for a person who is blind to be able to see is a miracle. It also is something that produces something that is contrary to nature. That is to say, it's natural for a fever to pass, or for a bone if it's broken to heal uh, to mend but what's different about a miracle is that it happens by command and it happens immediately um, uh, if by powered by intercessory prayer or that bone heals or that fever stops all of a sudden then it, then that is considered a miracle then aspect number three it gets complex, but the, there's a reason for it being complex, too. It has to be beyond the order of created nature. It has to be solely the work of God that is not in the created powers of God. It is attributable only to God, but the divine acts are considered miracles if there's not an order of nature that is natural. For example, uh, something that occurs that, that nature could do and would be happening every day, like the sun coming up, uh, uh, or it's something that would be seen as different from, for example, in the Bible, when it talks about rain coming out of the sky by the demand of a prophet, or the sun moving backwards, things like that. Uh, it has to be that which is beyond the order of created nature, beyond what nature could do in and of itself. Aspect number four is that it has to be extraordinary. Now, this is where I think sometimes there is a question about what is extraordinary. 
as uh, Debbie, what you said is that your children are involved in in, um, in work uh, with the, the the virus and yet have not contracted, which is a miracle. And and you could say, well, but they've been careful. They've done the right thing. They've had good protective gear and so forth. And that is why. Now, I would say, as you did, that that's a miracle. What I would do is for I'm going to give you a quote from my daughter's wedding over a year ago, just a little over a year ago. Uh, the quote is mine. And it was my post. And I said in that that in my office at church, there is a poster and a picture on it of Albert Einstein. And Einstein said, in this world, there are two types of people. One are people who believe that nothing is a miracle. It all can be explained. And two, the second type of people there are is that everything is a miracle. And so I say, looking at it that way, and I said what I said following that was, after June 3rd, 1977, I fell definitely in the second camp. That is the day that my daughter was born. A gynecologist might say, no, that's not a miracle. That happens every day. And I, but I would say for my daughter and for me and my family, that was an absolute miracle. Extraordinary, though, means, for example, uh, contrary to the ordinary, natural, and supernatural course of things. And we all, I think, have something like that. And finally, the last aspect if you're going to have a miracle, according to the Roman Catholic Church, is that it has to be sensible, which doesn't mean that it's uh, rational, meaning more that it's physically visible, you can see it, um, or you can touch it, or you can hear it. It's something that you know has happened, that you can definitely say things are different than they were before, than they were before. Miracles have a function within the uh, Roman Catholic Church to um, serve as a re- to authenticate God's communication with us. That is to say that God does still work with us and is still here. So, who in the world then checks out miracles? How do we know? Uh, how do we know that a miracle has occurred? And again, I'm, this is more the... Uh, the intellectual, the cognitive way of looking at it. This is not the way we'd ordinarily think about miracles. Um, It takes two miracles to win sainthood. So if you want to be a saint, you've got to have two. Not One is not enough. Uh, And there's a process of determining who becomes a saint, but that's a whole different thing. Uh, You can be, if you do good work and live a virtuous life, you can be deemed what is called a servant of God. I think most of us would say we are. Uh, then there are those people who have exhibited extra and heroic uh, types of things in their lives, and they are considered venerable. So you've heard the term the venerable so-and-so. To become saints, however, they need to have performed two miracles. The catch is they have to be done after death. So the church has to check out if the miracle really existed. And it's a very orderly process by which the Roman Catholic Church determines whether something is a miracle. It has a what's called a consulta medica. That is to say, a medical board, a panel of cardinals and priests that determine whether a cure came as a result of praying to a, a saintly candidate or if it was something else. If the miracle is improved, approved, the panel issues a declaration that says this is a miracle also known as the Miracle Commission. Uh, and this the commission, which is composed of about uh, all night theologians and scientific experts. Now, what miracles occur? More miracles occur are medical rather than anything else. As uh, Father, Father uh, Patrick O'Neill said, who is a part of the uh, Medic- Miracle Commission, that uh, of Rome, that 99.9% of miracles are medical miracles. But the doctors, it has to be something that is spontaneous, instantaneous, and complete healing. The doctors have to say, we really don't have any natural explanation of what happened. 
Now, for example, if a, if a, a person had, if a woman, for example, had a 10% chance of survival, and if she would, or, or a man would have 10% survival uh, rate after a heart attack and survive, it would not still not be a, a, a miracle because there was a chance that they could survive on their own. So that's why it's not by the Roman Catholic Church not given the label of a miracle. Now, there are things like that. For example, in, uh, in 2010, former Pope, Pope uh, Benedict, uh, Benedict uh, the 16th, Benedict the 16th confirmed that John Paul II had posthumously healed a French nun suffering from Parkinson's disease. Uh, and of course then, that it has to be that she prayed only to the person such as John Paul II and no one else. That is to say, so you're not confused about who performed the miracle. Um, science has explained things that have happened more and more over time, even in terms of healing. Uh, what today we survive, for example, a heart attack or uh, something else, or even the disease that we have uh, 50 or 60 or even 100 years ago would not have happened at all, uh, would not have survived. So the sudden healings that we have now, we can call he that uh, miracles, but also we can look at them as saying, you know, this is something that has just happened in terms of what we're learning and what we know how to do. So for sudden healings that are being considered miracles, in, again, uh, by the, the Roman church, that it, there has to be no medical treatment has given been given. The disease is serious and impossible or at least very difficult to cure by human means. But it's something that happened anyway. The trouble with this for us, many of us, is that if we say no medical treatment must have been given, sometimes people really want that to be a miracle, so they delay uh, care, medical care, medical treatment, uh, that really is important, that needs to happen. And say so do that so that it would become, that it would be actually a miracle. Um, anyway, in all cases, the bishop in the area is the first authority to authority that investigates the uh, the miracle. Um, in most cases, the event that happens is not ver verified uh, as a miracle. Uh, many of you know about the Lourdes, the the Cathedral of Lourdes in France, uh, known for its miracles. Uh, however, those again have to be checked out through this very lengthy process that I was just talking about. And they have said that while documenting over 8,000 cases that people have brought forth, cures that people have brought forth, that they've only really validated 70, 70 of those 8,000 of them as actual miracles because they couldn't go through all these uh, steps to make sure that they were miracles. So, so miracles is something that is uh, that has to be shown because we, we, in evaluating, we use logic, reason, and what we know, the gift of knowledge that God has given us to understand whether it was a miracle or not. That's why uh, there is a team of scientists in the, in the Roman Catholic Church. I don't know if, uh, if any of you have seen the show. Uh, Cindy and I watched it last uh, year, I think it was last year, a short season a show called Evil, uh, but it was uh, about a, uh, uh, a a young priest and, or, or uh, I guess he was maybe um, uh, a seminarian and a scientist and a psychologist that went to investigate. Their job was investigating these uh, events to determine whether they were a miracle or not. Of course, they have to show that this couldn't have happened by itself. So that's why there's a team of scientists that uh, are used in that way. And then we get off to another aspect of miracles. And this one to us is kind of uh, strange also, but uh, that is the, the idea uh, of relics, a relic. A relic is an object that... Uh, uh, is esteemed and, and venerated because of an association with a particular saint or a martyr. Uh, a relic is also that is something that people show to say, this is a proof that I've been or a part of 
how I've been healed or helped or someone has intervened. There's been a divine intervention for me. When I was a pastor in San Juan, uh, it was kind of a, a joke of uh, uh, the family when uh, Jessica, my daughter, would we go by the we were right next to the um, the uh, shrine to the Virgin of Guadalupe, which was a huge shrine, beautiful shrine. And we, as we drove by, Jessica would say, "There's the big church, and there's Daddy's church, uh, which was quite small." I always say that we were kind of in the shadow of the Virgin. You know, we were just a small church there. But in that big cathedral, they had a room in the back. And it was really interesting behind the altar area, behind the sacristy, there was a, um, a room that had just uh, like relics that showed that people had been healed. There were crutches back there or somebody would put their driver's license that said they were almost killed in a car accident, but they weren't. Or, uh, or, or a green card that said they actually got their green card. Things that to them were miracles and these were proof uh, proofs of the way that they had those uh, uh, those miracles occur, um, and then of course it uh, does even get uh, more bizarre, and that is to say, uh, uh, it, 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 up to uh, 2013, it was possible to purchase uh, two of the bone fragments of Saint Martha, a contemporary of Jesus. Uh, you could buy this on eBay. Uh, for the buy it now price of $1,090 <laughs> or a bone chip from the, the early Christian martyr St. Theodore uh, for $890. Now, I, I want to be clear that uh, eBay bans the sale of body parts. However, these relics are sold as reliquary. David, I've never heard of that uh, term before, but it's uh, uh, I guess it's uh, being of relic, uh, understanding that it come from relics. Uh, and the church has also dealt with uh, a lot of fake relics since the Middle Ages. Uh, there was one that was the brain of St. Peter. Uh, it had been venerated for uh, centuries in the Cathedral of Geneva. But when it was actually investigated, it was found to be pumice stone. So don't know what that says about Peter's brain, but it is saying that it really wasn't his brain. Uh, and then there was the arm of St. Anthony uh, that was long kissed by the faithful on festive occasions, which turned out to be the part of a deer, a bone of a deer. Uh, so, <laughs> and even there were times when the host itself, uh, the bread in communion, uh, the wafer, uh, when <laughs> the, the bread of the wafer was taken home because if it had actually become the body of Christ, you know, then it can be taken and used to heal people uh, as a talisman or something like that. Uh, so it, it's uh, it, it's easy to be abused. And of course, you can understand to this point why uh, Luther, Martin Luther, was so opposed to being cavalier about uh, having uh, relics and uh, venerating saints and looking at miracles. I'm watching. Um, it is true that the sale of relics has long been forbidden. However, there is a loophole. Uh, selling a container to hold relics is allowed. And if it just happens to have a relic inside, well, all the better, you made a better purchase. So that's still a part of it, uh, of the ways in which people get around having relics. Um, I think that I think a lot of us would say we have things that we consider very special to us. Uh, uh, even pictures of our children or of our family are like having something that uh, is as if they're there with us. Um, but uh, the idea of relics from the standpoint of being in involved with miracles, uh, it gets much more uh, sketchy. Um, uh, the, the death of uh, Pope John Paul II in uh, 2005 uh, was a boon for the relic market uh, because everybody wanted uh, whatever they could get. He was a beloved pope, as you might recall. And so uh, everybody wanted to get a part of him, but there was not going to be anybody that took anything a part of his body. However, there were things like his 
uh, private secretary requested the vial of blood uh, from the Pope just after he died uh, from his doctor as kind of a remembrance. And uh, so later, this same art, uh, it was given to the archbishop, though the blood was given drop by drop to different churches and dioceses clamoring for a relic of uh, Paul II, John Paul II. And of course, there was also hair that was cut from him. These, by I don't know, well, by the way, these are called first class relics. A first class relic just simply means, not that it's great, but it means simply that it was taken from the actual body, uh, and in this case, from this Pope. So there was, and since it was only something that could be done without taking a part of his body, otherwise, that's to say, an arm or a leg or a finger or something like that, uh, then he, uh, these, these first class relics were pretty rare uh, and quite limited. Now, this I found this interesting too, that the Roman Catholic Church has a, uh, a catalog of <clears throat> officially recognized body parts. This uh, registry includes the hand of St. Teresa of Avila, the finger of St. Thomas, the head of St. John the Baptist, although this was claimed by several churches to have had this head, uh, the toe of St. Francis Xavier, and the tooth of St. Apollina. So the, the uh, Catholic Church has to be very careful in terms of what is considered actually a relic and what is it that came from and from whom it came, were they actually a saint? Uh, if you're a person that's considered virtuous enough, you are a servant of God. But of course, with a, if there's heroic levels, then then you are considered venerable. And finally, uh, if you uh, perform miracles, then uh, you have the sainthood. Uh, we also have the Shroud of Turin. Some of you are familiar with that. It is not really considered a relic because it's not from the body of Christ. Um, however, there were imprints on this shroud, this uh, linen cloth, that clearly resemble and, and are felt to be the image of Christ. Now, there were early studies done in the late 60s that said, no, they thought that the, uh, the, the material itself uh, was from medieval times, which would make, of course, too late and not be uh, real or not be that the body of Christ. But there were so many things in it that looked so much in the in the uh, the negative of the terrain of the shroud that looked like the body of Christ that they said you know that really may be possible and so there were later examinations that showed that it actually did come from the time uh, of Christ from be between about uh, 200 B.C. to 100 A.D. in the, in the timeline. So the discussion uh, is still kind of open. There also are uh, what some of us are familiar with and have it has become popularized in movies and so forth, which are exorcisms. Um, exor an exorcism is the practice of actually evicting demons. Uh, the Bible shows uh, several cases where Jesus did that uh, and said that this will be a sign of the time of the coming of the kingdom of God the exorcism of demons, the casting out of demons. Um, there are a lot of times when those types of things that happen, people that were mentally ill were defined as having demons or doing things that no one else could do were considered to be demons. Um, and again, today with modern science, instead of modern science, we use psychiatry uh, to explain a lot of the things that would ordinarily have been deemed mentally ill. Uh, and of course, you have to remember that it kind of depends in part on where we are. There are some cultures who consider those people who hear voices uh, as being in contact with someone from another world, and therefore that is very valuable. Uh, how, however, for most of us, on a more rational level, say, no, we really don't think that that's what it is. We think that this is uh, schizophrenia or another mental disease, a psychotic break or something like that. I remember my, 
my supervisor in my clinical pastoral education, uh, rather than saying uh, them and us, said that the, the schizophrenic is someone who sees and hears things that we don't see and hear. Not making necessarily bad or good, but saying that that is, that is part of the issue. And for many of us, thinking about it, we have things that we would say, I, I mean, how many of you have said from time to time, uh, you know, I think that I, I just read that book and it's like it was written just for me. Or I heard that song and it just it, it, it gave me a message. Or I was driving down the road and I just happened to see this particular billboard and therefore I think that was a sign to me. Now, and we, we don't maybe base a lot on that, but it is the same. It's on the continuum. That is to say that there are uh, external things that are happening and, and occurring uh, to us, for us and to us uh, that seem to come from outside and don't come from us uh, necessarily. So that any any questions or thoughts about that? That is really the uh, the viewpoint of the Roman Catholic Church on miracles and relics. Any thoughts on that? I have a question. <clears throat> Do you have an idea about the number of miracles that are occurring contemporary times versus ancient times, or is it a continuous thing? Or sporadic or still happening one of the uh that's an interesting question uh woman from the next room um the, <laughs> i love you uh uh we didn't practice this <laughs> but um no it, uh, one uh one bishop i don't remember his name maybe it was father o'neill uh, from the commission anyway said that for some priests that it has taken up more than 50% of their time just hearing about miracles that have occurred uh, or the things like that, um, again, and things like exorcisms and so forth that are, that are asked for. I think that two things have happened here. One is if you're more aware of or alert to those things that are miraculous, there's going to be more of those things happen. And secondly, it, we live in a world that is much more a global community where we can find out what's happening, for example, in Lebanon uh, or in Rome or wherever, uh, pretty immediately. So we have, it's much easier to gather or get a sense of all the people throughout the world uh, that, are, that are thinking that there are miracles. So that's why the report is that there are many more today uh, than there were in the past. So the ELC does not have a statement with respect to miracles, but uh, the ELC uses the Book of Concord, actually, goes back quite a ways. Uh, the, so, and so, which really moves nicely into uh, the second part, uh, and that is talking about the Lutheran perspective uh, on miracles. Now, the Lutheran perspective is not nearly so rich or well developed we don't have all these rules about how we determine whether something really was a miracle or not or determining whether someone uh was prayed to or not for a miracle or something like that i i would like your thoughts on why you think that might be why do you think uh for the lutheran church uh, there there aren't so many uh, uh processes that occur to or processes that have to go through uh, to determine whether something is a miracle or not. Armin, I, I was going to ask you about that. Um, I, I wondered if it had some connection with um, with Luther's um, disenchantment with relics and um, and and maybe the connection between those um, miracles that happened around relics or something like that. Yeah, it certainly was. But you got to the end before we got to the middle. But you're right. <laughs> Good point. David, what were you going to say? I was going to say that so much of miracles in the Catholic Church are surrounding saints, and which is something we hold very differently from the Catholic Church. So we don't tend to look for miracles in that way. Um, and I think we look for miracles a lot more generally and don't really talk about it because we really don't know how to define it. 
Absolutely. And truthfully, the relics were um, a means for a lot of cathedrals to get money. So yeah, but, yeah absolutely. And, and I mean, it, when we think about 1500, it was something. Oh yeah, Barb, did you have? But you would think the Lutheran Church would have had even more stringent rules about defining those things because of their reaction to yeah, the, yeah. They, they did. And in fact, in some of the apologies, some of the in, in, a part of the Book of Concord, and I'm going to quote a little bit from the Book of Concord uh, in 1500, it, it, they were speaking very, very strictly about that. Martin Luther had, was pretty um, disdaining of the uh, things that people were considered uh, miracles or relics uh, or, or some of that were saints. As, as you, we all know, that we uh, look at ourselves as all being saints and sinners. Uh, at the same time, yeah, yes. Nick, Nick, you're on mute. Although he doesn't realize it. Nick, you're on mute. If you I'm, unmute I'm, yourself, I'm, I'm here. Okay. There. Um, in the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church, we're all saints. Okay, the difference on when we talk about saints in the Catholic Church, we're talking about those that miracles have been performed through. You know, there's lots of, you know, my parents are saints. You know, grandparents, sisters, you know, we're, they're all saints. They're not recognized as saints because no miracle has been uh, performed through them, whereas in the Lutheran Church, we just say we're all saints. Yeah, and yeah. Don't have any specific person as saint. Yeah. Well, and I, I think uh, in this day and age, we would probably add to that. Uh, public school teachers are saints too. I think. <laughs> uh, for I think a lot of people would add te school teachers as saints as well. <laughs> And I think I, I think there's another element to that too, um, because as you know, things can be decided by the church, and then but 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 society and individuals still move in a different direction. Like for example, you know, the church saying, "Well, relics won't be sold." Well, there we find ways to do that. You know, the Roman Catholic Church found ways to do that, um, and so. But I think that perhaps in Lutheran church, for the most part, we're more knowledge based, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, rational. And, uh, but, but it, as, as some of you have said, uh, for Martin Luther, the issue was, we want to be careful of these things. He says, uh, we need to prayerfully consider these truths since there are far too many false teachers out there who are using false signs and wonders. Now, you know, as uh, David said, you know, a lot of the money that was gathered in this way uh, was for the sake of building cathedrals or gathering art uh, uh, for many things that now we really admire, uh, but it was from people who uh, uh, felt that they were paying for a miracle or paying uh, a saint to help them out and do what they wanted. Uh, just a, a little note that the Book of Concord, which is written after uh, Martin Luther's death was a way to help people uh, that were that were Lutheran to say, okay, this is what we believe. You know, it's where the creeds are, the, the uh, Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. Uh, they were all a part of that, and as well as different writings about things like miracles and so forth. Uh, Martin Luther said, for example, in Matthew 24, 24, and Mark 13, 22. If you'd like to look at those, Matthew 24, 24, all both talk about uh, not looking for signs, you know, at the end time. And if you recall, you know, Laz the story of Jesus telling, uh, telling about the uh, Lazarus, at the poor man at the gate, you know, begging for food and not getting any and dies, and uh, then is in heaven, and, uh, and, and the rich man then also dies and uh, is in hell. And uh, in the story, then the, the rich man says, Please let me go back uh, and tell my brothers, you know, and so forth, so that they do the right thing, so that they don't end up where I am. And, uh, and the point of it is uh, in that 
the story then is said that you know if they they've had the prophets and the prophets have told them what to do and how to live and if even then even if someone came back from the dead it still would not be enough sign uh, for them to know that uh, th what the right thing is to do uh, Martin Luther really kind of ties it up and uh, for the things that really makes it the most important problem for him uh, about miracles and relics and so forth is he says I would not want the grace to perform miracles for those who pay no attention to the word the word of God against which the whole world has no reason to grumble will not be moved by signs. Martin Luther didn't feel that the miracles or people seeing miracles would convert them, would help them become Christian. Uh, and, and furthermore, he says, God will perform no miracles so long as problems can be solved by means of other gifts that he has bestowed on us. So in other words, if I pray that uh, a miracle happened that all of a sudden um, we have equity and justice in our country, in our land, in our world. Uh, Martin Luther is kind of saying, no, nope, not going to happen because that is something we have power to change and to do and to do differently. Luther in and of himself was not necessarily um, anti-miracles. But on the other hand, he wasn't pro, uh, pro miracles either. Uh, in the Book of Concord, which is kind of like people have asked what it's the Book of Concord is like. The, the Book of Concord is kind of like the frequently asked questions uh, for Lutherans at the time. This is a way to understand. This is a, if you want to know what we think about certain things, this is where it comes from. But in that, um, uh, one of the things that's uh, quoted from that I quote from there is uh, referring to Deuteronomy chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 uh, and, and the book of Concord says one must not believe every sort of miracle and wonder for Moses predicted that false prophets would also perform signs and wonders and there were people in Jesus time who were performing things uh, uh, we might call them magic or uh, even healings that occurred at that time. And we've learned that there is a, a connection between body and, and mind. That if I really truly believe something, I'm much more likely for it to happen. Uh, studies have shown that people who are really strong and, and thinking ahead and wanting, uh, thinking about what's going to happen after they, are, they heal from a certain disease are much more likely to actually heal from it than someone who does not feel that way. Uh, St. Paul clearly prophesies uh, the reign of the Antichrist and all these things by the signs. It would come with all manner of signs and wonders. Again, saying, be careful about all these. Um, as I said, Martin Luther did not feel that these signs would and these uh, miracles would convert anyone. He says, we shall not let ourselves be diverted by the claims of the signs and wonders that Mary and other saints have done, nor by the skillful way they throw dust into our eyes to lead us away from the word. Since we hear this warning that these false signs have to happen, we shall be smart enough not to believe in any mere sign Christ says in effect that faith should not rest on signs and wonders alone, but on the word. And that's where it finally comes into saying, you know, Martin Luther is saying the miracle for us is the word of God. The fact that God has become incarnate in Jesus Christ and that that is the greatest miracle. He says there is one great miracle and that is it. There is, as he's, uh, the words of Martin Luther, what can be said that is more marvelous than this, that the son of God assumes the flesh of man and is born of a virgin. What is more astonishing than this, that the Son of God, battling with death and the devil, allows himself to be overcome, offers his life to his enemies, and overcomes while being overcome. And the miracle supreme is this, that the man Christ who died on the cross rises from death and from sealed grave on the third day, and ascends to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. Those, so, 
therefore, again, as I said, he's not totally anti-miracle, but on the other hand, he certainly isn't pro-miracle. And ask us to be just very careful in what we look at as being uh, something that is actually a, a miracle or not. So, uh, the, any any uh, thoughts, questions, uh, disagreements about that? I'll, I'll use my quote of uh, Albert Einstein saying, either you see everything as a miracle or some people see nothing as a miracle. All explainable. And, and you know, in our world, we have found more and more things that are understandable. The things that we might have thought was a miracle, uh, like I said, 20 years ago, is not necessarily today. Yeah, yes, Nick? Yeah, um, this whole thing, you know, Martin Luther was correct, and, you know, there's a lot of bad things going on in the Catholic Church. If they would have corrected their stuff, Luther would have just been super happy to move forward. But the church, the Catholic Church, failed to do that because there was greed and, you know, a lot of corruption going on at the time. And Luther took off. You know, the miracles, I think Luther may have been against the, the miracles as such because the church, the Catholic Church, was using miracles to make money. And that was wrong. And he, he called them on it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think we have to, like I said, he is, in my confirmation class, I actually uh, hand out to the class copies of the 95 Theses. And some of them are really pretty rough uh, on the church. And uh, and, and, and I, I, I agree with you, Nick. I think uh, if so many things of the church, Roman Catholic Church today were true then, there might not have been a Reformation. Uh, there might have been, but anyway, his, his words are, you know, a lot to the effect that uh, all the the money that comes in for indulgences and for relics and uh, for miracles to be done and so forth went to uh, line the pockets of those who were in power, and of course, uh, for people who, and I, I hesitate to say this, but if for people who are not as uh, well-educated as we are, who didn't know what we know about things today, it's more easy to uh, to trick them and to get them into to doing something, to giving something. I mean, there were so, and right now today, you might say, why do you build this beautiful, wonderful cathedral that is such a glorious thing? And, uh, and while there are people who are starving, who don't have enough food to eat and who don't, you know, don't have a home, and so forth. Why wouldn't the money go to them? Um, now, the flip side of that is what you and I uh, might enjoy if we go uh, travel around Europe. We love the uh, beautiful cathedrals and the artwork and uh, and the Sistine Chapel and so forth, uh, even though it may have been money that was uh, used in that way, spent uh, for miracles or for relics or for indulgences. Uh, ways in which uh, the uh, the Roman Catholic Church was able to to build itself up. And I think I want to, oh, I'm sorry, uh, David, did you have something, or, or Debbie? Oh, actually me. I was thinking um, this kind of contradicts some of the things you said about miracles. And I guess I fall on the side where I see everything as a miracle because I feel like even things that we can explain feel like miracles sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, I, I um, yeah, I do. I'm definitely, and I'm definitely in that category of the uh, everything is a miracle. Um, it, 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 I think especially if you've had children, it's hard not to feel that way, I think, you know, in, in birth. And I think that when you think about the, uh, for example, I'll just use child, a, a, a child being born, that whole process, you say, well, that's the way it works, and that's nature. But I would say that is an incredible miracle. That yeah, I, I for for me, it was thinking, you know, it is a miracle when I think of all the things that could go wrong. That a child was born that is healthy, and is okay. Uh, 
you know, we, we look at children who have uh, problems when they're, and you think, well, isn't that terrible? Well, on the other hand, isn't it amazing that so many children are born healthy and well and grow and, 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 and the process of growth, even though we understand it, doesn't mean that it's not a miracle. So, uh, I don't know if I, no, I don't have time, but, um, this is what we're going to look at uh, next week. I want to whet your appetite. Uh, some of you may know Rob Bell. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he uh, he is a, he's an American author. He was at one time voted to be one of the top 50 influential Christian writers. Is, is that right, Danielle? Does, <laughs> I think that, I think that's, that's what he was. And uh, he, was, he founded the, uh, the church in, um, in Michigan. And uh, Mars he was, he, I'm sorry. It's called uh, Mars Hill. Yeah, that's it. That's right, Mars Hill uh, uh, Bible Church, and it just grew incredibly fast. Uh, and uh, under his leadership, and he was uh, in uh, around that I don't know 2010, 2011, uh, named the on the top list of the hundred most influential people, uh, and. Uh, Anyway, he uh, he was uh, he was at odds with the people of the not out of that church, but uh, in in general because of his uh, belief in people being uh, taken care of and saved, and not people going to hell. Uh, well, what I always say is uh, he was condemned to hell because he thought that other people were not condemned to hell. So anyway, there are a lot of people that were opposed to his writing. But anyway. I think a lot of you people, a lot of you may know him or have read things about him. I, I, I find him very refreshing. And uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, bring a, a short video of him because I want to talk about something. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about the miracles of the Bible uh, how, and how we understand them and look at them in, in, four, in, in four different steps. First of all, what is the miracle that occurred? The ten, the miracle, and then secondly, uh, what is the purpose of that miracle? Then, and then third is a possible explanation that we might understand it in a normal way, and then finally, what is its purpose now? And the reason I mentioned Rob Bell is I think he does a, uh, he has a, a, a video series, and I recommend it on YouTube. Uh, it's called Everything Is Spiritual, and uh, in that he talks about all the things that have to come together for the world to be here and to be okay and for us to be on this globe that's spinning a thousand miles an hour uh, and still we're just fine we're sitting here and and we get enough sunlight and enough dark and not too much sunlight not too much dark and all those things that come together uh, that really you'd have to say boy that's pretty incredible uh, and yet, you know, of course, there are scientific explanations for all of it. And he, I think he does a really, one. it's just about five minutes, but he does a really wonderful job uh, of looking at that and explaining that and, and talking about that as a way of saying, uh, you know, it's pretty miraculous that we're even here, that we're even alive, that we're even able to uh, exist in this world. Um, then second, then that's the first. So the so the first part of next week will be talking about miracles, including the big one, you know, uh, the creation of the world and so forth. But then also some of the miracles that we read in the Bible and the ways that we might look at them then, the way we might look at them now, and then kind of what that means for us now. If miracles are exactly as they say, and we look at the Bible as a textbook, then those miracles occurred. But that's the end of that. Uh, and then the second part of next week, we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about um, uh, miracles and ourselves, miracles and prayer. You know, what's the connection between prayer and miracles? Uh, what about for us? Uh, what about when we pray? Is it wrong to pray for miracles? Obviously, we often pray for things that, you know, we don't know we have much control over. We have, there have been a lot of prayers that we've had, and, you know, as a part of the, uh, the, the care team and the, the prayer warriors uh, at Triumphal Love, there have been a lot of people we've prayed for. And in fact, being apart from them it makes it even harder to say there's something that we can do to be closer to people. We really can't. So we, de we depend on our prayers to say, 
this is our way of supporting and, and, uh, and entreating God uh, for the wealth, uh, well-being, and the health of an individual. So anyway, that'll be the second part. So I hope that uh, that that's uh, helpful for you knowing what we'll be doing next week. Um, so any any last thoughts or questions or things you want to be sure that we do talk about next week? Well, I toast you with my coffee, and uh, we'll see you all next week. God bless you all. As we said, it's just so good to see you all. So good. Take care now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Armin. Thank you, Armin. Thank you. you Excellent job. Absolutely. Good to see your face. Yours, too. <laughs> yeah, we all miss you. <laughs> Thanks, Armin. Good to see all your faces, too. Hope everyone has a good week. And stay healthy. Yeah. Thank you, Vernetta. Bye. Good seeing everybody. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Good Bye. to see you all. Wow. It's a good thing my face wasn't on there because. Well, it might have been on theirs. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how that worked. You might have been the unknown. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Maybe I was. Uh oh. <laughs> ah, there you are. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> At least I wasn't up there continuously. <laughs> Love everyone. Love you all. Okay. Okay. I'm going to cut out. Okay. Meeting details. I mean, look over. Okay. Oh dear. I can't get rid of it. Oh dear. Okay. There. Again, okay, the camera's off. Yeah.